If you gave a thousand people a list of adjectives to describe themselves with, and one of the adjectives was happy, and another of the adjectives was social, you'd find that those who rated themselves high on happy would also rate themselves high on social, and those who rated themselves low on happy would also rate themselves low on social. And by looking at those patterns of covariation, you can determine what the essential dimensions are of human personality. One of the dimensions is roughly happiness. That's extroversion. Another dimension is neuroticism. It's a negative emotion dimension. So if you ask someone if they're anxious and they score high, say on a scale of one to seven, they're also likely to score high on another item that says that they're sad. And it turns out that negative emotions clump together. And so that people who experience more of one negative emotion have a propensity to experience more of all of them. There's another dimension called agreeableness. And agreeable people are self-sacrificing, compassionate, and polite. If you're dealing with an agreeable person, they don't like conflict. They care for other people. Um, if you're dealing with an agreeable person, they're likely to put your concerns ahead of theirs. They're non-competitive and cooperative. Uh, it's a dimension women score more highly than men on agreeableness across cultures, including those cultures where the largest steps have been taken towards producing an egalitarian social circumstance like Scandinavia. Actually, the gender differences in personality there are larger than they are anywhere else. Um, another trait is conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is an excellent trait if you want to do well in, in school and in work, especially if you're a manager and administrator. I can't say we understand a lot about conscientiousness, although it it reliably emerges from factor analytic studies of adjective groups across different countries. Conscientious people are diligent, industrious, and orderly. Their orderliness tilts them towards political conservatism, by the way, because it turns out that your inbuilt temperament, your inbuilt personality, which constitutes a set of filters through which you view the world, also alters the manner in which you process information and influences the way that you vote. And so you might say, and I, I do believe that this is true. Our, we've been doing a lot of research on this as of late. The more accurate a measure you take of someone's political beliefs, the more you find that personality is what's predicting them. And I, I think that's a reasonable thing to think about because you know you have to you have to figure out ways of simplifying the world, right? Because you just can't do everything. And so people are specialized. They have specialized niches that they occupy. You can think about them as social niches. Like a niche is a place where your particular skills would serve to maintain you. And so if you're extroverted, you're going to look for a social niche because you like to be around people. And if you're introverted, you're going to spend much more time on your own. And so if you're an introverted person, for example, you're gonna want a job where you're not selling and where you're not surrounded by groups of people who are making social demands on you all the time because it'll wear you out. Whereas if you're extroverted, that's just exactly what you want. And so the extrovert sees the world as a place of social opportunity. And the introvert sees the world as a place to retreat from and spend time alone. And it turns out that both of those modes of being are valid. The, the issue, at least to some degree, is whether or not you're fortunate enough to match your temperament with the demands of the environment. And I suppose also whether you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough so that you're born in an era where there actually is a niche for your particular temperament. Because it isn't necessarily the case that that will be the case. Imagine that all of these temperamental dimensions vary because of evolutionary pressure, right? So there's a distribution of extroversion, a normal distribution. Most people are somewhere in the middle, and then as you go out towards the extremes, there are fewer and fewer people. And what that means is that on average, across large spans of time, there have been environments that match every single position on that distribution, with most, most of the environments matching the center, because otherwise we wouldn't have evolved that way. And so sometimes being really extroverted is gonna work well for you in a minority of environments, a minority of niches, and sometimes it's just gonna be a catastrophe. I suspect, for example, that if you live in a tyrannical society where any sign of, 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 of personally oriented activity is likely to get you in trouble, that being extroverted and low in neuroticism wouldn't be a very good idea because you're gonna be mouthy and happy and saying a lot of things, unable to keep your thoughts to yourself, and you're gonna be relatively fearless. Now, I don't know that for sure because we haven't done the studies that precisely match temperamental proclivity to environmental demand, but you get what I mean. So, 
conscientious people, anyways, conscientious people are industrious and orderly. We know a little bit about orderliness. It seems to be associated, strangely enough, with disgust sensitivity, which I suppose isn't that su surprising. You know, if you take an orderly person and you put them in a messy kitchen, they respond with disgust and want nothing more than to straighten it all out and organize it and clean it. And there's tremendous variability in orderliness. Um, and as I said, orderliness predicts political conservatism. It's not the only thing, but it's certainly one of the things. Um, the correlation between conscientiousness and, and gr grades is about 0.4. It's about 16% of the variance. It's, it's the second best predictor of university grades after intelligence. And we'll talk about intelligence during this course too. Intelligence is actually a relatively straightforward concept. I don't think I'll get into it today, but conscientious people, their industriousness and their orderliness makes them schedule their time. So they make efficient use of their time. They use schedules and that sort of thing. We haven't been able to figure out anything about the underlying biology or psychology of industriousness. We've tried really dozens and dozens of tests attempting to find a laboratory measure on which industrious people do better and we failed completely. And there's no animal models of industriousness either. And so I would say it's a great mystery that remains at the heart of trait psychology. Um, and maybe it's a human specific category, you know? I mean, you can think of sled dogs maybe of being industrious and maybe and maybe sheep dogs and animals that work like that, but of course they've been trained by human beings. So, but it isn't obvious that animals are industrious the same way we are. I mean, industriousness involves sacrificing the present for the future, something like that. And you, it seems like you have to be able to conceptualize time in order to sacrifice the present for the future. One of the things that I would recommend that you do as students um, in this course, and, and maybe in every course, speaking of industriousness, is come up with a plan of attack for the course and, and use a scheduler, you know. If you treat your university career like a full-time job, you're much more likely to succeed. And if you keep up on the readings and you keep up on the, on the essays and all of that, then you're much li li less likely as well to fall into despair when you get too far behind using a Google Calendar or something like that to organize a schedule for the entire semester at the beginning of the semester can be invaluable, especially if you're not very industriousness, very industrious, because it can keep you on track. And one of the things we know about industrious people is that they are very good at using schedules and at planning the use of their time. And so I would like to say that you should all be smarter, but I don't know how you could be smarter. It, we don't know anything about how to improve intelligence. And, I suppose we don't really know anything about how to improve industriousness either, but I can tell you that people who are industrious come up with a strategy for solving the problem that's ahead of them, and then they do whatever they can to stick to the strategy.